Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar by the Institute of Leadership and Management. My name is Nicholas Lynch. I'm a consultant working with the Institute, and I'll chair the, the webinar today. It's my pleasure to introduce today Finn Jackson. Finn is a coach, consultant, and author on strategy and leadership in times of change. He's designed and implemented top-down strategic change across three continents. Reviewers of his books said, a blueprint for winning any game your business chooses to play and essential reading for any leader who wants to thrive in times of change. So I think Finn is very well placed to talk to us today about ownership and social responsibility. Finn, can I hand over to you? Uh, thanks very much, Nicholas. Uh, it was a great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking about social responsibility um, as part of ownership. And I thought, how can I communicate in a quick way why this matters? Um, and I know you're not all from the UK, but if I was going to say from, with two words why social responsibility matters, um, I'd say Grenfell Towers. We had a, um, a building in London that burned down last year, um, and the inquiry about that opened last week in London. Um, many people died. And that, I think, is a real, it, it's a highlight. It's an extreme example, but it's an example why social responsibility um, and taking account of more things than just money really matters to us. Um, if I thought of another example that's been in the, in the news the past year, um, you might say Harvey Weinstein. Um, that's an example of what can happen to an organization when one person doesn't behave well towards um, employees and other stakeholders. And again, you might say that's a very extreme example and, you know, I'm not Harvey, so it won't happen to me. But imagine that you were part of the leadership team at the theatre in London called the Old Vic. And you discovered that Kevin Spacey had been doing things um, that many people didn't like. How would you manage that? So social responsibility, I think, is an issue that can have a big impact on all kinds of uh, organizations, even organizations that seem as though um, they're kind of impervious. Um, so that's part of what I'm going to talk about today. But also, I think the main message that I want to get across today um, with social responsibility, although I've started with those kind of risk-oriented ideas. Um, the main issue I think about social responsibility is that it's a huge opportunity um, for all of us to do more with our organizations, uh, more with our customers, and more indeed with, for ourselves. And hopefully this afternoon I'll give you um, some brief insights into different ways that you will be able to achieve that. Now this presentation, as you know, just to set some context, is part of the Institute of Leadership and Management's Dimensions of Leadership um, series. Um, they see dimensions of leadership as changing over time, and they currently see five uh, dimensions that it's important to focus on. Now, for example, if you were operating as a leader 200 years ago, achievement would have been very important to you. If you were someone like Napoleon, um, then achieving results might be the only thing that mattered. Um, perhaps in the late part of the 20th century, collaboration at the bot bottom part of the diagram would also start to become more important. Um, but today I'm going to talk about um, the three pieces along the middle of the diagram there, um, which are where I'm, I'm focusing my work at the moment. And they're the, the dimensions of vision, which creates inspiration for the organization, um, authenticity um, for the leaders who are acting in the organization, and most specifically um, today that we're going to talk about ownership, um, taking ownership of your actions authentically um, and your responsibility for those. So let's look in a little bit more detail about ownership, which is what we're focusing on today. The Institute of Leadership Management um, defines these different aspects of ownership. Um, now at the top in the middle, you can see it's about assuming responsibility or taking responsibility for everything that you do. But it's, all, it's also about to achieve that, you need to do all of the things around the edge, like learning about your personal brand, taking the initiative and so on. And if you kind of go around the full list, empowering, time management, learning from mistakes, decision making, problem solving, and critical reflection. If you do all of those things together, that's what ownership is about for the Institute. And the final button there on the bottom left-hand corner is social responsibility. Now the Institute says that leaders can demonstrate ownership, that's all of those points, by being socially responsibility, sorry, social responsible in all of their activities. Or if I turn that around the other way, if you learn how to be socially responsible, responsible in all your activities, then essentially you are demonstrating this key um, thing called ownership, a key dimension called ownership. 
So this is another reason why social responsibility is so important. It's the key to it all. It's where the rubber meets the road. So what do we mean by social responsibility? Now, I'm kind of doing a, an introduction um, from the beginnings all the way to where we are today with social responsibility. So let's start at the beginning. Um, and traditionally, social responsibility is seen as CSR or corporate responsibility. Um, that moved then to become being seen as a good corporate citizen. Um, and that extended still again um, in the third part of the presentation we're going to look at today into ethical supply chains. So I'm going to walk through each of these in detail. And then I want to emphasize as well, there's a fourth area not shown on the chart, which we'll come to at the end, which is all about um, creating inspiration in the organization. Um, and it's about self-actualization as, as us, us, as lead, of us as leaders um, and self-actualization also of our employees and our customers. So let's start though with CSR, corporate responsibility. <clears throat> what do we mean by that? Now there's a guy called Archie Carroll, who way back in 1991 um, described a pyramid of corporate social responsibility. Now he said, to begin with, every company has to be economically responsible, because if you don't make a profit, then the organization will go out of business. But once you've done that, then you have a legal responsibility as well to obey the law. If you achieve that, then you also have an ethical responsibility um, to do what's right, just and fair. And you also then, on top of that, you can add, if you want to, um, the idea of being a good corporate citizen, having a philanthropic responsibility. Now, this is almost kind of 30 years ago. Um, and in hindsight, it kind of looks quite out of date, but it's where corporate responsibility came from. And if we want to understand why it came from there, we need to look back 20 years even before that. Well, there was a guy called Milton Friedman, and his view was that the sole business purpose of business was to generate profit for shareholders. Nothing else mattered. There was just one stakeholder, the shareholder, and there was one thing that you had to do in running your business, only one thing you had to care about, and that was how much profit you made. So 20 years after that, this social responsibility, corporate social responsibility pyramid was quite an advance. Nowadays, I would take it and I would kind of turn it in reverse. I would say that to be a really successful business, if you think, for example, about Yvonne Chouinard at Patagonia, who's built an incredible brand, um, what it makes sense to do now is to think first of all about your philanthropic responsibility. What's the good that you want to do in the world? Then think about your ethical responsibility. How can you do that in an ethical way, which for Chouinard might be, for example, sustainable materials? Then how do you think about your legal responsibility? And finally, how can you make a profit from doing the good that you want to do in the world? So 20, sorry, 30 years ago in 1991, Archie Carroll defined the corporate social responsibility pyramid in this way. It's still a good framework. Um, but I'm going to suggest that by the end of this presentation, you'll see that if you want to be really successful in social responsibility, it makes sense to, to look at it upside down, if you like, and start from the top. What's the good that you want to do in the world? But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Let's look a bit more closely again at corporate resp social responsibility, which is where this all came from or how it started out. If we see you know, the core purpose of a business is to make money and then corporate social responsibility is something that we add on top of that, then we can kind of invent some reasons or come up with some, reasons, some benefits of doing that. And they are listed on this slide. The first one really is about employee engagement. Employees like to work uh, for a company that they feel is doing good in the world, um, not purely making money. So they feel more engaged. When they're more engaged, they're more productive. And in, engaged employees are better at innovation. They come up with new products and services. And they'll also be better at saving costs for the business. So from a kind of financial point of view, these are three benefits of CSR. Beyond that, if you've got more innovative uh, products and services, then you're going to engage your customers better. And if you adopt um, CSR initiatives, like, for example, the Fair Trade Initiative, um, then you're also going to gain some engagement with, with customers. 
um, the ones who are interested in that kind of thing. So there's another benefit from adopting a CSR agenda. Ultimately, you can then move into brand differentiation because you're different from your competitors. And you also gain from a CSR agenda more long-term thinking. Um, if you have long-term thinking, then you get consistency and greater productivity in the short term. And it also helps the organization, obviously, to survive over the long term if that's what you've planned for. So these are the kind of the standard reasons for adopting a corporate social responsibility uh, agenda. And there's a last one as well, which I've added, which I think probably ultimately, although again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, this wasn't the, this wasn't the reason that people adopted CSR agendas back in the 90s. But as it's turned out, this is one of the major benefits. If you take on these extra responsibilities um, in delivering, delivering value to these extra stakeholders, and that is your bench strength of your leadership. Because basically, it's more difficult, it's more complicated to try and do these things for a variety of stakeholders than it is to just serve one stakeholder to shareholders and just focus on one number, the profit. So by adopting a corporate social responsibility approach, the kind of hidden benefit you get is that your leadership becomes stronger and stronger leadership becomes more able to run your organization better, especially in a time of change. We can see this in some of the companies, in fact, the top five companies um, of a survey uh, of corporate social responsibility um, reputation in 2017. Um, you can read for yourself the top five companies there. These are not companies that only do CSR. These are companies that anybody, I would suggest, would recognize as quality organizations, both to buy from and to work for. Um, all of them except Microsoft and Google there have been around for a very long time, and they're trusted known brands. Um, you can see on the left the quote about Lego. Uh, they came top because they behave ethically they conduct business fairly, they operate transparently, uh, they protect the environment, and they also support worthy causes. So you could say that CSR has become, for these companies, it's more than just a kind of um, compliance, uh, you know, doing things if I have to. It's somehow it's become part of their culture. It's about behaving ethically. It's about conducting business fairly. Um, and that's put them, they're all successful companies, uh, and these are the ones who do that best. So CSR is not only about ticking boxes, it's also, it makes you a better business. You get better performance. Let's move on now to the second way of thinking about social responsibility. So we started with CSR, which is a big change from Milton Friedman. And that then kind of shifted, as we could see in the Lego example there, to something called being a good corporate citizen. What does that mean? Well, Samantha Sharp did a survey um, of companies last year, and she asked 72,000 Americans, as it says, what does being a just company, a good corporate citizen mean to you? And we're getting here a bit more clarity about what it means to do good social responsibility. Now, the replies she got back were, it's about quality goods, it's about treating customers well, it's about the environmental impact, it's about the communities that the business operates in, um, it's about ethical leadership, behaving well, not taking bribes. It's also about diverse leadership. People are starting now um, to think that being a good corporate citizen is about diversity in who you promote to positions of leadership. And that's, um, we've had a lot about that uh, recently to do with fairness in wages for women. And above all, as it says, it's about treating workers well. So this is kind of like a snapshot 2017 America, what good corporate citizenship looks like. And we can see that compared with Milton Friedman back in 1970, it's about dealing with a whole load more stakeholders than we did before, about caring about them. And it's about behaving in different ways towards those stakeholders, whether they're the environment or customers, um, the communities uh, and the workers above all, as it says. And it's also about a different style of leadership uh, which we'll come back to in a minute. What are some of the activities that would indicate good corporate citizenship? Well, this um, study by Sarah Cadvertis in 2012 was looking purely at the corporate citizenship activities 
um, in relation to how they generated in, um, enthusiasm amongst employees. Um, she was interested in that because basically employee engagement uh, drives productivity, which drives cost reduction, um, agility, uh, product innovation, and so on. And what she found um, at the high level was that corporate citizenship did uh, indeed drive um, employee engagement significantly, and that in turn drove um, profitability of the organizations um, significantly. And you can read for yourselves here some of the specific organizations that, um, or, sorry, specific activities that organizations undertook um, that were classified as corporate citizenship. So for them, philanthropically, which is the top of that um, pyramid we saw earlier, it's about giving money, it's about sponsoring events, it's about giving grants uh, and matching the donations um, to charities made by employees. It could be whole, about holding annual service events or encouraging uh, employees to do volunteering or volunteering based on a particular skill set. Um, and it's also about not only energy efficiency initiatives, but interestingly, I think um, what they call here social business innovation. Um, what that is, is looking for ways to innovate the business in ways that um, serve particular social needs. Now, that, that might be the social needs of a group of customers, um, or a group of potential customers that have never been served before, um, like Yohannit Mohamed Yunus did with his um, Grameen Bank. Um, or it could be looking at initiatives that um, operate for the social good of the employees. Um, but all these things drove the enthusiasm of the employees, and that in turn, in a kind of virtuous circle, pro positive loop, um, drove the productivity of the organization. Um, organizations, as you remember, like BMW and Lego. So that's the second of the three bubbles. Um, the third is about ethical supply chain. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about this because although on the one hand we've seen the level of social responsibility increasing um, over the years from CSR to corporate citizen, it became something you know, we'll do if we have to, to something that's actually driving results. The whole um, phase of globalization in, in the late 90s um, put, provided a shift that could have pushed the needle backwards, if you like. Um, companies like Nike thought that, you know, if I produce, if I shift my manufacturing of shoes overseas, then I don't have to care about CSR anymore. Um, something similar happened with um, Apple in 2012. Um, when they had outsourced the manufacture of their iPhones to Foxconn, um, and the issue came to uh, came up about the treatment and the working conditions of, of people at Foxconn. So, what um, Nike found, uh, although they thought that um, they could allow uh, CSR issues and workers' conditions, um, they weren't their problem anymore because they moved overseas. What they actually found was that. Um, activists back in America made it an issue, uh, and in um, 2000, and, sorry, 1998, um, the reality that Nike found was that their corporate profits fell by 70%. So, although you might think that the supply chain revolution uh, would diminish the need for corporate citizenship, uh, what Doug Guthrie uh, wrote about in 2012 is that actually it demands citizenship that's even more robust. Um, even if the contractors and suppliers are on distant shores, as he puts it, um, actually it makes it more important that you manage uh, your CSR uh, initiatives um, and behaviours, not less. And that means that you have, even though you're using a supplier uh, who isn't directly owned and controlled by you, you actually have to get better at defining and codifying how you want that supplier to behave, and you need to be get better at measuring and reporting. Um, how they have behaved in reality. So supply chain is important because on the one hand it could have appeared to weaken the drive for um, socially aware business but the effect in reality is that it's made the drive for it uh, even stronger. What are some of the specific issues that might come up in supply chain? Well as you might expect it's about working conditions, it's about paying working hours, uh, it's about environmental awareness. And again, we're getting now into 
humane treatment and non-discriminatory treatment, uh, bribery and corruption, child labor, and ultimately freedom of employment and association. So it's about um, slave workers in some case. Now this won't obviously apply to everyone on this call, but these are some of the issues that have arisen um, from people who didn't really see them coming. And so I think the lesson here for all of us is to realize that um, an ethical approach, uh, a social respons socially responsible approach can help to identify risks um, before they occur, which is good for the business. But coming on to the kind of fourth piece now um, of corporate social responsibility. We've seen, I think, uh, a trend um, over time from the purpose of the business to make money um, through CSR, co corporate citizenship, and then the uh, extended supply chain. And where we ultimately end is that business needs to take care of its workers. It needs to look after its, its customers. And in the late 90s, um, a movement, I think I can call it, grew called Conscious Capitalism. Now, the pictures here are Franz Trumpenars and Charles Hampton Turner, who wrote a book called Nine Visions of Capitalism. Uh, they didn't invent the idea of Conscious Capitalism, um, but they did summarize it as part of their book. And you can see here that we're kind of reaching a point now, where we have reached a point, where corporate social responsibility is not just about, well, tell me what I have to do in order to be seen as a good citizen. It's about starting from approach, as I said before, starting from the top of the pyramid and saying, let's think about, let's consider all of the stakeholders, not just the state shareholders. Um, let's realize that companies in the future are gonna be the ones, the ones that succeed the best, are gonna be the ones that engage well with a whole variety of stakeholders. We can't have a successful business unless we've got uh, loyal customers. We can't have a successful business unless we've got enthusiastic employees. Um, stakeholders, uh, shareholders, and suppliers are just part of the part of the, the picture. So we need to think really about how can we best engage with all these stakeholders, <clears throat> and conscious capitalism is a way of doing that. Um, the key of conscious capitalism is that it has to be led by a conscious leader. Uh, it's the way we run organizations today is that we have a leader who tells, uh, who directs other people uh, or facilitates other people in what they do. So to make conscious capitalism work, you need a conscious leader who gets commitment to cooperation um, from a whole range of stakeholders uh, and then focuses that uh, co collaboration to catalyze innovation and engage customers. Um, the Between 1996 and 2006, uh, the Standard & Poor's 500 um, show the bottom line of this approach as being an eight times better performance um, by firms that call themselves firms of endearment. And there's a slide on that now. Oop, no, sorry, that's in one second slide. There's a picture here then of how conscious capitalism works. Um, start at the top in the middle, you need a visionary leader who is following some higher purpose. In order for them to have higher purpose, they need to kind of know who they are and what they care about. So this is Yvonne Chouinard who decided, I want to make ethical clothing and, and uh, sports gear. Um, that leader can then grow and develop employees who nurture and inform suppliers and partners. They then attract customers who share the same higher purpose, which might be environmentally um, aware products and so on. Um, and also serve community environment <clears throat> outside the business. Um, by creating a kind of virtuous circle of all these different stakeholders, the net result then is that investors are also repaid. But that comes from a, a natural outcome of building a synergistic system that focuses on aligning a whole set of stakeholders rather than just purely trying to, stay, uh, trying to make money, which is where we started way back in, in 1970. So there's a book also called um, Firms of Endearment, which was what was mentioned in that Standard & Poor outperformance by uh, eight times to one, written by those three guys at the bottom. And they said that uh, conscious capitalism was about helping people find self-actualization. That's about knowing who you are and what you, what you care about and then putting you into a role where you can become that, become the best of who you are. 
It's about transforming capitalism. It's about creating happier, more productive working environments overall. And it's about a shift from purely functional relationships to emotional relationships between uh, people in which emotional contracts are honored. Ultimately, all stakeholders win, including the investors. Mervis and Goggins, so we, we've, we've come, we've had a look now uh, from the beginnings of CSR through the different stages to corporate um, conscious capitalism, which is where we are um, for many companies nowadays. Um, Mervis and Goggins back in 2004 identified five stages um, that a company can go through on a kind of journey to becoming, becoming more conscious themselves and the leaders becoming more conscious as well. Um, the elementary stage is about compliance with what has to be done. The engaged stage is about having corporate-wide policies um, that put into place what has to be done. The innovative stage is about engaging stakeholders in consultations and forums and conferences to kind of build a stronger relationship with the stakeholders. The integrated stage then is about formalizing those relationships um, through ongoing processes. And really, I just it's about shifting to a relationship with a stakeholder rather than a transaction, um, but an ongoing relationship uh, that includes training as well. And finally, the transformative stage uh, is where a company uses social responsibility to drive revenue growth, um, using its understanding of stakeholders to identify new markets uh, and create new products and services for those markets. So corporate social responsibility isn't just a single thing. It's kind of like a, it's a journey of deepening um, understanding um, by the leaders and also um, deepening um, results for the organizations that practice it. How might we respond to the challenge? Well, the Institute of Leadership and Management has identified um, five bullets, <coughs> uh, which certainly I think are good starting points. Um, every organization can start by having a, an ethical policy or code of conduct. They need to include high ethical standards as criteria in supplier selection. Um, policies for CSR need to be clear and consistent transparent um, that allow a level of trust to be built into the supply chain both for the purchaser and supplier and that's really what we saw when we were talking about supply chain uh, the fact that you're working with uh, remote partners means that you have to formalize how you want each other to behave and then there needs to be auditing to measure and report back on what reality is uh, and that needs to include things like transparency which historically you know, companies used to work reasonably well together without transparency but if you want to have a really effective csr approach uh, transparency needs to become part of it which again requires trust which is about building re ongoing relationships um, with key suppliers and ultimately i think i would like to stress also the main thing is to look for not just for the risks sorry but for the opportunities um, and the opportunities which we outlined there under the heading of conscious capitalism um, Corporate social responsibility is an opportunity for employees and leaders to take on roles that help them become who they are, to self-actualize. It's an opportunity to find new products and services for groups of customers like Mohammed Yunus did with Grameen Bank who aren't served um, well by the current way of doing things and to provide new products and services for them that match their needs. So they get to self-actualize and become more of who they are as well. So that's, a very brief introduction to corporate social responsibility. Um, there's a picture here of a whole bunch of references you can go to um, for more information. Um, and this will be available in the replay when that's uh, issued. Right. But for now, I'd just like to say thank you very much for participating. Um, for more information, there is a leaflet number 36, which the Institute has produced about this. Um, and that, as we started off, right. it's just one of the five um, uh, dimensions of leadership. Thank you very much. Finn, thanks very much. Just uh, we're quite tight for time, but just maybe a couple of quick questions. Several people have have, have talked about, um, and you yourself talked about how this this concept has developed over time. And a few people have said, you know, do you see, what do you see as the emerging issues? So, for example, uh, inequality, um, you know, or contract like zero hours contracts, things that were acceptable in the past but are not acceptable in the future. Um, and it was interesting that we had Google as one of the top firms there 
and the importance of data is now given how firms treat data. So I just wonder with your sort of vision looking forward hat on, do you see things practice that we, we have now which we're going to have to tackle if we're really going to take this corporate uh, this social responsibility on in the future as it develops? Yeah, I think it's a it's a very good question, but I find it a very difficult question to answer because um, kind of if you went back a year um, or two years, would you have been able to predict some of the issues that have come up? Um, mm. I think looking forward, it's very difficult to do the same. I think equal pay for women is a very key and I think very important issue here in the UK at the moment. But I I, I don't want to kind of skip the question, but I. Yeah. I think it really depends on the particular, it's, it depends on your business, your organization, uh, that will have different issues um, to anybody else, um, although shared issues with some as well in, in case of uh, equal pay for women. Well, just to, maybe to pick, that's, that's actually a good link to my second question, which is you talked about, you know, when uh, Nike and other, other firms, they offshored their production and, yeah. and then they got into trouble. To, to what extent is, is, that is standard seen as from a very sort of cultural or local uh, perspective, you know, that, that we look at someone, someone in the U S looks at how, what someone in Vietnam gets paid and they say, Oh, that's not enough. Those conditions aren't very good, you know? Um, but actually they're, they're completely missing the local context because that might be a, a considerable improvement in, in the, in that market. So to what extent someone's put it quite, bluntly here and said you know this is just cultural imperialism it's just you imposing <laughs> your views on someone else um how do you see that i understand that let me think about that a second i think probably in, in some cases it might be but that's the i guess the one the joy of dealing with multiple stakeholders who don't agree with each other and that's why you need the conscious leader in the middle of that to say, you know, I've got one stakeholder here in, in the West shouting this thing. Um, I've got somebody else over here shouting this. How do I manage these relationships with these different stakeholders? And how can I find a way through that's the best for the organization? Um, I think, you know, with people, there isn't a right or a wrong answer. There's just how can you find an answer? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about Foxconn and Apple, uh, the working conditions there were appalling for the people, um, but Apple stepped up and say, said, actually, no, we choose, our suppliers must do these things, otherwise they're not gonna be our suppliers anymore. Yeah. So I think a mix of a whole load of things, you can call that cultural imperialism if you want, or you can say that's Apple staying true to their values. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, Really interesting presentation, Finn. Thanks for taking it, taking us through that and for and for looking at our questions. So no more for me, just to thank Finn uh, again for his excellent presentation and to wish everyone a, a very pleasant evening. <laughs>